All right. So what I'm talking about is uh, Enable. Everybody familiar with the Enable community? Uh, we'll do a little run through of it. Yeah, I, I think a few of us know exactly what it is. Um, so what I did is uh, I tested the four most popular Enable designs, risk-based actuated designs, uh, and I, I found a clinically validated test, so something that prosthetists would use, that medical providers would use, uh, to try to show or demonstrate uh, that these are similar to medical devices or, or maybe not similar to medical devices. We, we wanted to see. Uh, so a little bit about Enable. This is my, uh, and some stats about why this is necessary. So this is uh, World Health Organization stats. Uh, World Report on Disability in 2017 says about 15% of the global population have disabilities. That's roughly 1 billion people worldwide. Uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities recognizes that access to devices to help these people is a fundamental human right. So we need to get them these devices. How do we do that? The big problem right now is only about 10% has access. So that's a very small number. Healthcare providers uh, and projections of future providers don't exist in the numbers that are needed to meet this need. So even if everybody became a prosthetist or uh, occupational therapist or physical therapist, they're still not going to meet the need that's, that, that exists out there. So what we want to figure out is can untrained volunteers bridge this gap? Can we provide them with the training, maybe uh, give them a particular set of skills? So what we want to do uh, is we want to try to help these people uh, those needing access to these devices, they're often stigmatized and shut out from society. Uh, a lot of this happens in the developing world. Um, of those with access to devices, as many as 45% actually abandon their upper limb devices. Why does that happen and, and can we improve that? The abandonment of poor or disappointing function. So, maker skills to make comfortable and functional devices. This is kind of our big question. Uh, and this is where Enable comes along. So this was started by uh, Jen Owen. If you don't know, she's in the room, she's front and center. So we have her to thank for all of this. Uh, Enable is a group of people all over the world that are trying to use digital skills, uh, digital tools to make uh, assistive devices. It's not just uh, hands, known for superhero hands, but we make all sorts of tools. And who are enablers? Uh, engineers, professors, students, artists, designers, teachers, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, MDs, prosthetists, OTs, PATs, PTs, anybody you can imagine can be an enabler. Anybody can participate in this. That's the beauty of it because it's all open source and everything is freely available for anybody to use. So what does Enable do? What they get most publicity for is building superhero hands. This is how I got started. One of the students at the university I work at saw a Star Wars arm and she wanted to build it. Uh, and nobody else at the university wanted to learn 3D printing. So they gave it to me and said, you're a physicist, physicists do everything, so you figure it out. So I did. Uh, once I started 3D printing hands, uh, students all wanted to work in my lab. So I went from about one or two students per semester to about 50. So I get lots and lots of students that, that really want to do this work. Uh, Enable releases all of their open source designs, more or less. Uh, we iterate to improve designs. So there are um, some that we've retired because we figured out that they're not quite as good as the newer releases. We release open education materials and we release task specific devices. So if you want to get involved, these are the main websites I think that we can use to, to get involved. So Enabling the Future has tons of useful information. Uh, the Enable Hub is how the community communicates with itself, uh, with everybody else. Go ahead and join there, join up in the forum. And then Enable Alliance, um, they publish educational materials. So any teacher, I was anticipating maybe more teachers in the room, but we've got uh, educational um, kind of tests that teachers can do as well. Full lesson plans so that you can, you can test these devices in your classrooms. So we've got lots and lots of different devices. So these are all ones that we've printed in my lab. You can see there's a very wide variety. Um, we've got hands. The big white one is the Raptor hand. That's uh, more or less one of the more original designs. Uh, we've got the big brown one is the Kwawu arm. We've got the unlimited arm. And you can see a lot of these designs on the Enable table. Uh, all of these aren't actually Enable designs. Uh, you see the black hand, that is a flexible hand design made by a group called Open Bionics. Does anybody know who Open Bionics is? So they are a group that does, they have actually created the first uh, FDA approved 3D printed arm that works with myoelectrics. Um, and they release a lot of their plans uh, online for anybody to use, anybody to build. 
So why do we have all these different designs? Why is this even necessary? Uh, because of this guy who I have censored for all the kids in the audience. Um, this is something called the cortical homunculus. So what this is, is this is a kind of representation of the sensory model and the motor model of the human body. So where are the most sensory kind of nerves and where are the most motor nerves? And if you look at that, where are the most sensory nerves in the human body? Where is it? Hands. Where are the most motors? Hands. So these hands, they're very freaking complicated to make. So you see in the media all these stories about making this bionic arm and, oh, all the fingers are going to move independently and it's going to be wonderful. Uh, we are very far away from that. That is not easy to do. Um, the most medically advanced uh, prosthetics in the world, they actually make one of them just down the road from where I live at Johns Hopkins. Uh, the, it's a couple million dollars of research that goes into doing that. The arm itself is several hundred thousand dollars. Um, it's been also integrated into the guy's arm, but it's only for one person. How does that help the 10% of 1 billion people, 90% uh, of 1 billion people that need access? So the fancy stuff, hard to do because of these sensory and motor models. So we need simpler designs. Uh, so the enable devices, that's what they are. They're simpler designs, but do they actually work? So the first thought is seek user input. Right? We're giving these away. We've got how, like 10,000 that we've given away, roughly. Right? It's, it's hard to track them all. Um, so systematic surveying of user experiences and data collection on device and usage and abandonment. This would be great if we could do this, but it's a bit like herding cats. It's difficult to get this information from everybody, uh, especially when we're giving these to people in low resource areas that might get them and, and then we never find out if, how they're using them. There is work to, to continue uh, uh, being done to, to kind of uh, figure out this information, but that doesn't help us right now. We've got lots of enablers, uh, over 10,000, that all want projects to do. Um, so what can they do after they print these hands if they don't have somebody to give them to? That's where this challenge came along. <laughs> um, extremely difficult to allow thousands of random volunteers to collect systematic data from, from their users. That's really hard to do. So what we did, uh, is I tried, I asked these questions. Um, how can volunteers that don't have recipients test these devices? So somebody that's making a hand, and I'm not going to give this to anybody. I just want to test it and see how well it works. So I don't have a recipient, but I can still make some contributions. How can I do that? And kind of make that test clinically assess the function of enable designs. So it has to be something that uh, is validated, that the medical community might not laugh at. Uh, something that's easy to perform and something that's repeatable by anybody. We have people all over the world doing this, so we need easy tests. And the data should be systematically collected and shared. So I looked at the literature and found a whole bunch of tests. Uh, these are what medical providers do. They test activities of daily living. Um, can I, I use these devices for personal hygiene, changing clothes, pushing buttons, uh, zipping up a zipper, holding utensils, cooking, any of those uh, activities. Um, so that's one way you can test these devices, testing all of those different options. Uh, there's a device assessment, assisting hand assessment, the AHA. Uh, the study's creators actually said, don't use this for kids. A lot of these hands go to kids, so we don't want to use that. Uh, the prosthetics upper extremity functional index, the POOFY, uh, targets users doing tasks and completing surveys on their task completion experience. And then we have Able Hands Kids. Oh, that sounds great. Simple, well-documented, limited resources uh, to needed to do them. There's a problem with all of these. Can anybody see the problem with all of these? I, I want somebody that, that is making this device and not actually giving it to somebody. What do all these devices require? They require a recipient. They require you to be giving this to somebody and finding out what that recipient thinks. Okay? We've got our surveys to do that, and, and that's that's proving to be difficult. So all these require users, not good for the challenge that I set. Right. So what I found was this uh, box and block test. This is a test done to assess people with kind of weaker grip strength, uh, maybe elderly people, maybe people that have had strokes. Uh, it's published in 1985 by Matthew Awitz. Uh, it's, it's really exactly what it says. You take a big box and you take a bunch of little blocks and you have this box that separates the um, uh, this uh, separator that separates the box into two sections, and you pick up a block, move it over, put it in the other side. Pick up a block, 
move it over your barrier, put it on the other side. Pick up a block, move it over, put it on the other side. Very easy test, but it's been used to assess prosthetics. So our test hands, we have, uh, at the time that we did this, uh, these were the four most popular hand designs. The Unlimited Phoenix has a three-pin tensioner. Uh, there are examples of that on the Enable table. You can go look at the Captain America hand. That's a three-pin tensioner. The Phoenix version 2 has something called a Whipple Tree. Uh, we can discuss more about that if you want to know details at the end of this. We'll have plenty of time. Uh, so this is the uh, three, uh, Phoenix version 2. The Raptor hand uh, has a five-pin tensioner. I don't have an example of that one. And then the Osprey hand uh, has this kind of loaf profile bracer to, to wear and uses a uh, kind of different tensioning mechanism. So we have these four hands that we're going to test. And how do we do this box and block test? Well, we need a way for people to actually use them. So we created an emulator. This is a universal emulator. You can take it off of one hand and put it onto another. It consists of a little bar that the person can hold when they're operating the hand. Uh, and then it's got an actual wrist uh, bracer that you strap onto your wrist. Uh, and then you can hold the hand. And I can operate this hand even though I have fully functional fingers. Right? So now we don't need to chop the fingers off of our testers. Good. We don't want to do that. Okay, so we made the emulator freely available on Thingiverse. You can go download it once Thingiverse actually starts working again. Uh, the methods, how do we do this? We have 10 right, uh, right hand man. I say right hand. Anybody seen Hamilton? It's a Hamilton joke. I guess there's a right hand man song in Hamilton. I don't know. I haven't seen it either. It popped up on the web. Okay, so we have uh, 10 right handed uh, individuals, uh, eight men and uh, no, eight women and two men. Uh, each individual gets a short practice section, session, so they get 60 seconds to, mo uh, about uh, 10 seconds to practice moving the blocks across. Uh, and then we strap a hand to them, and we see how many blocks they can move in a minute. That's it. That's all the test is. Super easy. You could do this with little kids. You could do it with elementary school students all the way up through college students. Uh, order of hands that you give them is chosen using a random number generator so that they don't uh, get to practice with one hand and then get really good by the end. The last hand always gives a better score because they've figured out how to work it better. Okay. Each participant performs the test uh, without their emulator hand, so they just use their regular hand to move the blocks, and then they perform it with each of the four prosthetic designs. It takes about 20, 30 minutes maybe. <laughs> and this is what we get. So hand order, there's maybe some uh, slight indication that there's a positive correlation. You can see First hand, second hand, third hand, fourth hand. If you fit a line to the kind of top of the bar graph, it's a little bit positive. So maybe they move slightly more blocks with the last hand than the first hand. Uh, we need more data to tell if there's anything actually statistically relevant there. Uh, average score by hand type. So we have the Unlimited Phoenix, the Phoenix version 2, the Raptor Reloaded, and the Osprey. OK, which hand should we get rid of? Raptor Reloaded. Raptor Reloaded should not be used for functionality because it is statistically worse than all the other hands. What's, uh, should we get rid of any of the other hands based on that plot? What do you think? Anybody? No? None of them? Keep them all? You won't offend me. Keep them all? Yeah, so statistically, we can keep all those. Statistically, they're indif indistinguishable. Uh, we need more numbers. We need better statistics to actually figure out uh, if that holds for uh, large samples. This is where you would come in and teachers would come in to actually do these tests in their classroom. Okay, and get us more data. More data, we can, we can be more confident. Uh, so let's compare this. So this is not just something we pulled out of our butts. Uh, this is a test that, that actually exists in the literature. So the FDA has used this to test prosthetic hands. So you can see on the right-hand side, there's the box and block test. There's their emulator testing a prosthetic hand. It's a commercially available prosthetic. There is uh, the co-author of this. Uh, who I forced to go to a different talk during this time, so he's over there. Um, there he is uh, actually applying, uh, showing our, our data. So we have the Phoenix version 2, the Phoenix Unlimited, the Osprey, and the Raptor Reloaded. Those are the average number of blocks that you would move uh, in a minute. And then we can compare that to commercial devices, so something you buy from a prosthetist. The Hosmer Hook is the, I, I believe it's the most popular prosthetic in the world. Uh, that moves about 30 blocks in a minute. The TRS Grip 2S hook moves 22 blocks. The Auto Bach hand moves 17 blocks. So actually, our hands, that's not too bad. That's pretty comparable to the worst performing commercial hand, but still commercial hand. Commercial hand, you're going to spend hundreds of dollars. Ours, you're going to not spend a thing. 
Okay? So these do compare favorably, favorably to commercial options. Um, that, that's one of our big uh, findings. I think that's pretty cool to see. So the results, the Raptor Reloaded is statistically worse in performance. Uh, it should be retired or chosen only if you're really interested in aesthetics. If you like the looks of it, perfect. Uh, a lot of users anecdotally don't use these a lot for function. They use it for the look. So if you like the look of it, go for it. Use it. Okay. Other designs are all statistically the same. So it doesn't really matter which one you choose. Uh, choose the one that you think looks best, looks coolest. Uh, choice of design should be really aesthetic uh, in nature. Designs are comparable to lowest performing commercial devices, and we just need more data to really get more information out. Uh, and we need to apply testing to the style of devices that are more like the commercial ones. So something like this design is called the two tree. We need to test this one. This one can move blocks probably a good bit quicker. Okay. And we need to test uh, something called the gripper thumb terminal device. So that's one, uh, that's this design right here. Um, I've, I've hooked this on up to a motor. Uh, you can read about it in a poster outside. Uh, but this works similarly. So you'd use a Bowden cable system, something uh, to actually actuate it. Maybe you bend your elbow and that makes the thumb open. Uh, this works much more like the commercial devices. So we need to test these two as well uh, and figure out uh, how these compare. I suspect that these will compare much, much more favorably to the uh, commercially available devices. So if you want to do this, if you want to contribute, uh, there's a link here to the spreadsheet that will let us collect all the data or a QR code that you can just scan and get access to the spreadsheet. We can show you what it looks like. It's all up and ready, available for everybody to put in your data. So we got age and gender. Those are kind of useful demographic kind of information to know. And then we've got the hands. These are the most popular. Uh, we can always add more contact info if you want that. Uh, and any comments that any tester would have. Just toss your data in there when you do it. Um, if you have any questions, happy to answer anything you want to know. Yeah? Okay, that's what I got. Uh, right now, well, uh, from the prototype that you're working, I see that the only movements that it actually does is just basically just like flex the fingers mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. mechanics of the hand is like way more complicated mm -hmm. than that, of course. Mm -hmm. like just like bend things like yep. that. Have you, are you guys working maybe in another prototype that uh, can move more that complexity? Mm -hmm. There are as many designs almost as there are enablers. Uh, to get the single individual finger motions, you really need a mechanical device. Um, so we have groups that are working on that. I think one of the big groups that's made the biggest strides, Enable uh, Metalin, uh, actually just released the second version of their myoelectric design, which gives you individual finger motions. Uh, I, actually, I believe it's, it's three fingers linked. So you have two fingers, two fingers, and, and then a thumb. Because uh, you really need to keep the weights down on these things. Uh, so a prosthetic device, actually, uh, I, can, I can speak to this one. So this is, this is my mechanical design. It's about one and a half pounds total. Uh, that's what a commercial device weighs. Um, it's actually about uh, 0.75 pounds on this end and about 0.75 on the back end. Uh, and even this is a little bit too heavy still. Uh, so when you start putting more motors in and motors that actually have good strength and good grasping ability, uh, that increases the weight too much to make it actually useful. And the battery, is good. And the battery life is horribly difficult. So this one lasts about... Uh, well, it's been running today and yesterday, and I haven't had to charge it. It can be charged very easily. You just plug it in with rechargeable batteries. It lasts usually about three or four days uh, before we have to charge it. Um, but yeah, the better batteries we really need. Uh, and the really big challenge is Enable is all volunteers. We do this all for free. So to build something that's really, really lightweight and really functional and really cheap, you, you kind of can't get all of those. You need to... It, kind of can pick two. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And usually in, in the commercial space, what you lose is, is low cost. They'll charge you a ridiculous amount. So, trying to... Um, so how exactly do you like trigger the movements in those uh, In these? Yeah. So uh, if a recipient were using them, 
then uh, what you do is you strap this. Uh, so you imagine they need a wrist. So they need uh, some uh, movement on their wrist so they can bend. Uh, imagine I don't have fingers. We have little plates that you can screw across here instead of a little handle. You strap their, um, their wrist, their forearm into this with Velcro, and then their wrist pushes against this little window and it'll close and then open. Mm -hmm. So if they've lost, uh, if they have a wrist, we can make them one of these. If they have um, a residual limb, usually about one to two, probably one to two inches you need really to get enough leverage. Uh, we can shift this wrist mechanism to the elbow. So it's an elbow actuated arm. So when you bend your elbow, that closes the fingers. Uh, you can see all these designs at the enable table. They have versions. Um, there is a new shoulder actuated design that's out as well uh, for if you've lost your whole arm. Um, and that's, I think it's only, I think it's been tested on one person so far. Um, but yeah, yeah, so we're working on those too. Uh, there's a lot of work to make these all um, modular as well. So different pieces plug and play nicely with other pieces. And it's all open source. So just go online and you can download anything. Yeah, what's up? Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of like the 3D printing the, the hooks? So that is the entire concept behind this. So it works and functions and should function and provide the same functionality as the Hosmer hook, but it looks like a hand. So the difficulty with the hook uh, is a lot of our recipients that really need these in the developing world, uh, they need something that looks <coughs> aesthetic. Um, so, yeah. We had uh, eight females and two males, so we only got 10. And what age range were they? They were all college age. They were all 18 to 22. <laughs> yeah, and I think, so, sorry, it needs to look at me. There I am. Um, so it would be helpful to actually have the kids, and I think it's a great project for them because it's not difficult. They don't have to test all four hands. We just, we just need numbers. We need more testing, more kids to test these. It's a project you can do in a weekend or in, in, a, in a day in a class, a couple, couple minutes. Uh, and all you need are little blocks. You can print all the blocks you need for what it's worth. Um, we went ahead and bought the $200 box and block system apparatus, but you don't, you don't need that. Just print the blocks and move them over. I think it'd be a great project for some of the older elementary school students, middle school students, and high school students that really want to make an impact and don't have recipients and have all these hands. Yeah. So test them. Would you be um, willing to write something out to put on the website? Oh, yeah, sure. And Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, it's all ready to go. It's all linked up. They can just scan codes and... And I'm freely available to answer any questions. And we can put more hands into this, too. We can test more. That's not a problem. You guys are taking volunteers from all over the United States? or All over the world. I'll take anybody. Yeah, that's, that's the enable idea. That's the beauty of it and the power of it, I think. They get everybody. Yeah. Anything else? No? Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's it's uh, some of its expectations. Some of it is um, if there's somebody that is a congenital difference and they didn't get started with the prosthetic right away, they've kind of learned how to adapt and they can do things easier without a prosthetic. Um, a lot of the times, it's been the the device is too heavy or it's uncomfortable or doesn't fit right. A lot of times with kids, they'll outgrow it. Um, a lot of times with adults, again, they just, it's easier without a device. Um, so wide variety of reasons. And it's not just our devices. This is a problem in all of upper limb prosthetics. 
So the ones that the doctors provide, they abandon those. And, and that's not really well understood or very well studied, I, w I would say. So, yeah. So when they first get it, they, they, they must like it, right? And how long, how long <coughs> does it take before they abandon it? Yeah, um, abandonment usually occurs within uh, three to six months. They just kind of put it in a closet and they stop using it. Um, it depends on the type of device as well. So uh, the body powered one, they kind of abandon a little bit quicker usually. Uh, a lot of times that is due to uh, discomfort in actually using it. Um, you get a lot of muscle imbalances with the way the body powered prosthetics are made. And uh, from what I can tell, there's not a lot of rehab um, work done to help them to strengthen the right muscles and teach them the right exercises. Uh, so I think if, if you did do that, that, that would help. Um, for the myoelectric hands, people like them, they're functional, but the problem they have with them is, is they're either way too heavy or if it breaks, because they're very complicated. So once it breaks, you then have to take it to a clinic um, not a lot of clinics make them, so you might have to, um, there's, there's one very popular uh, woman that, she's, she's an actress, I think she calls herself the bionic actress, and she has to drive from New Orleans to Houston to get her arm looked at. So you have to travel quite a ways to sometimes get the, get the arms fixed. Uh, and then the other problem is charging, so she often forgets her chargers. So she'll be plugged in at the airport and take pictures and, ha ah, I forgot to charge my arm. And um, that's, that's another reason for abandonment. It's just very inconvenient. So, yeah, variety of reasons. So a lot of the uh, reasons that you mentioned yeah. are independent of the design, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So it's really <coughs> a difficult problem. To, it's an intractable problem. To yeah, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to solve. So what I concentrated on was the problems that I can address. I can make sure that this is as good as possible. And then once I know this is as good as possible, then we can start looking at some of the other issues and, and how to fix those. Um, one of the big solutions I think that's coming out is this device called, uh, it's called a MIT wearable. So instead of being uh, a more of hard plastic kind of prosthetic, um, instead of needing a prosthetist to fit it to somebody, because fit is very, very important, uh, it's made out of fabric with kind of a harder shell casing. <coughs> and what you do with that is you can cinch it to the user's arm so you can print them and make them in a couple different sizes, maybe a large, medium, and a small, uh, and then they can get it and they can size it themselves, uh, which really fixes the problem of um, not having enough healthcare providers, then you don't need one. So they can put it on themselves. Uh, and then you start linking in with Enable's, uh, a lot of their work on making task-specific devices and you just attach the device that you want to use mm -hmm. onto the end of that. So I think that's where a 3D printed hook, like you mentioned, would be a good addition. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think there's, there's solutions. It'll just take time. No? Any questions? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you.